Hello everyone, today we are going to be covering The Sickness Unto Death, a Christian psychological exposition for upbuilding and awakening by Soren Kierkegaard. A bit of a mouthful, I know, but we can expect nothing less from Kierkegaard. With that said, I've covered two other works of Kierkegaard, Either Or and Fear and Trembling, and I would suggest checking those videos out as well. I also did a full audiobook for The Sickness Unto Death if you want to hear it for yourself. What I've been finding as I read more Kierkegaard is that his ideas are very intertwined, so watching those might help you understand what he's truly trying to say here. The Sickness Unto Death is a book that I wish to convince everyone to read, especially Christians. It was quite eye-opening for me, and I hope to be able to communicate the ideas he presents effectively in this video. It's quite a confusing work at times, but Kierkegaard always finds a way to help you understand what he means, even if it might take more words than you'd expect. Sickness Unto Death is an existential book about despair. However, it isn't your average existential book, because Kierkegaard's perspective is far different than the majority of existential writers. Most existential writers wind up in some form of nihilism, whether it be traditional nihilism or optimistic nihilism, but not Kierkegaard. This is because Kierkegaard is a Christian, and this shapes the way that he thinks about existence and despair. His solution to despair is also far different than most other existential writers. Kierkegaard's Christian bent makes it really hard for many non-Christian philosophers to understand what he's trying to say. In the past few weeks, I have read through the book four times and watched lectures on the material, and what I've found is that most people do not understand the contents of the book on any real deep level. I believe this is because they are attempting to analyze Kierkegaard's extremely Christian work without any deep knowledge of Christianity. So being a Christian myself, I will attempt to give a different perspective than most on the sickness unto death, as it might be the most Christian work Kierkegaard has ever done. So before we begin to analyze the work, I want to define two terms Kierkegaard uses and explain them in a clear way. The first word, as mentioned before, is despair. When you think of despair, don't think of it as merely sadness or depression, because in Kierkegaard's eyes, despair is something far deeper. Despair is sin. Now when most people think of sin, they think it's just when you do something bad and God gets mad at you for it. But in the Christian perspective, sin is so much more. Sin isn't just something God doesn't like, sin is something that separates us from God spiritually. You may say, well what's the big deal? So what if I'm separated from God? Well in the Christian's perspective, God is not just some guy in heaven who tells you what to do and judges you for not obeying. God is the source of life, love, goodness, and joy. So being cut off from the source of all things good leaves us in despair. If we can use a biblical example for this, we could go to the Garden of Eden. Eden is essentially heaven on earth. Adam and Eve have everything they need and such a close relationship with God that they are able to walk with him in the garden. But as the story goes, they rebel against God's commands and this separates them from heaven on earth and their relationship with God. This is why sin leads us to despair. The more we go against God, the more despair we are in. So as this video continues, I'll be using the words despair and sin interchangeably because Kierkegaard does it throughout the sickness unto death. The second term we are going to be covering is yourself. Not yourself, but yourself. The self is a key component throughout the work and it is often misunderstood. I will be using this term a lot throughout this video, so when you hear it, think of your soul, your innermost being, the thing that makes you, you. The self that will stand before God the moment you die. This is your self. It's everything you are and everything you have ever done. Keep these two terms in mind. Okay, so let's go back to talking about despair. What is it in Kierkegaard's eyes? Well, to be in despair essentially means that the person is not aligning his or herself with God or God's plan for the self. In other words, when someone is going against God, their self will be in despair. Everyone is in despair in one form or another, but there are different levels, but we will cover those soon. Now throughout Sickness Unto Death, Kierkegaard is trying to convince people to be themselves. Not in a feel-good kind of way like, oh, you know, just be yourself and people will like you more. No, Kierkegaard wants you to fully realize yourself. To become entirely aware of your eternal self, the self that, after death, will stand directly before an all-knowing God who has seen everything you've ever thought and every action you've ever committed. 
Once we've realized this, then we can take one step closer to realizing the self that we truly are. But most people would think, this is crazy. Why would they want to expose themselves like that before God? They know the things they have done. They don't want those deeds to be seen. It seems counterintuitive to want to expose those deeds before an all-knowing judge. Wouldn't you rather want to hide them? But Kierkegaard is trying to show that in the Christian perspective, this is exactly what's going to happen, whether you like it or not. Facing this realization is better than ignoring it. Now after you realize that this judgment is coming, you will be in despair over it. But don't worry, there's a method to Kierkegaard's madness and there is a solution to this despair of knowing that we will stand before God with all of our sins laid out before him. So make sure you stick around for that because it's really important and the whole point of the book. Now another point I need to make here is that Kierkegaard is more than aware that not everyone believes in God. He says that these people have not even begun to realize their self or their position before God, and therefore are actually in a lesser state of despair. Their despair is limited to the finite world where they will live for a short while before their self vanishes into nothingness after death. In their minds, despair is limited to a finite time and is thus lesser in nature than to someone who realizes God's existence and the existence of their own eternal soul. This aspect alone is actually where most analysts of Kierkegaard get things wrong. In the Christian's perspective, all human souls are eternal, so if someone lacks this perspective, they cannot even begin to understand what the true sickness unto death is. I've heard many try and compare the sickness unto death to a mere sort of depression, but this is far from the truth. Here is how Kierkegaard defines sickness unto death. So to be sick unto death is not to be able to die, yet not as though there were hope of life, no, the hopelessness in this case is that even in the last hope, death is not available. Now in other words, to be sick unto death is to know that your soul can never die. The atheist who does not acknowledge the existence of an eternal soul that is ever present before God has no concept of the infinite world and therefore cannot even begin to understand what the sickness unto death truly is because their thinking is too finite and not infinite. So the atheist is in a lower level of despair, but what about the higher levels of despair? Kierkegaard says that everyone is in despair, but not all despair is equal. He says, just as a physician might say that there is no man that is in perfect health, there are no men that have no despair. And just as a doctor must become well acquainted with sickness in order to treat it, so too must we all become acquainted with despair. So let's become acquainted, shall we? Despair comes from two primary sources. Despair in not wanting to be oneself, and despair in wanting to be oneself. I know this is a little confusing, but don't worry, we're gonna get into it. So let's tackle the first one. Despair in not wanting to be oneself. This is where the concept of mass men comes in from my other videos. Kierkegaard would say that the majority of people fall into this first category. They are aware that they are a self, but they don't want to be one. They would rather lose their self in the crowd. They do not want to be noticed by God. They want to blend in in order to hide from him. They do not wish to acknowledge that their soul is ever present before God and he sees everything that they have ever done. They would rather deceive themselves into thinking that they can hide from God. Or better yet, they wish that they could stop being a self entirely. To cease to be eternal and thus to be separated from God in the infinite forever. In Kierkegaard's words, the despair comes from not being able to destroy oneself. The despair comes from always having to be oneself. And because they cannot cease to be a self, they find ways to suppress their despair throughout life. Rather than going after the source of despair, which is their soul, they turn towards outward things to solve their problem. Some may become atheists in order to lower their despair. Others may try to hide in a crowd and become mass men and another may occupy their mind with meaningless hobbies, a career, or family to distract themselves from the despair within. But all these solutions lead people into a dangerous place to be. They may succeed in suppressing their despair, but this is precisely why they will never be free from their despair. Kierkegaard says, not being aware of the despair in yourself is worse than being aware of it because you are lost in it. Knowledge of despair is the first step to overcoming it. Many people you speak to, and possibly even many people watching this may say, I am not in despair. But Kierkegaard would say, watch out. You may be in the most dangerous place of all. 
Not acknowledging your despair is hell because you will always be in despair. Despair can only be overcome when you stop looking for solutions outwardly and turn inwards toward yourself. The mass man may wish to die and vanish for eternity, but despair cannot kill an eternal thing such as the soul, just as a dagger cannot slay a thought. You must face your despair in order to overcome hell both here on earth and in eternity. But Kierkegaard warns, you must be very wary of awakening someone to the fact that they are in despair. Kierkegaard says that ripping a mass man from the delusions of not being in despair will drive a person mad and they will consider it akin to murder. Most people would rather live in their delusions that they have created rather than face the fact that they are eternally present before God. But worse than just being eternally present before God, they are eternally before Him as a sinner in despair with no hope of being connected to the source of life. The Bible says that we have all fallen short of God's glory, and anyone who says he is without sin is making God out to be a liar. The Word of God is often described as a light that exposes darkness. Those who practice evil hate the light and will not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. The mass men would rather hide among men, live for men, be praised by men, sell their souls to the world rather than become aware of their self before God. For what would it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world, but forfeit his soul? But oh how many men have done just this! Kierkegaard puts it so elegantly in this. And thus, it is precisely with the despair of finitude. In spite of the fact that a man is in despair, he can perfectly well live on in the temporal. In fact, all the better for it. He may be praised by men, be honored and esteemed, and pursue all the aims of the temporal life. What is called worldliness is made up of just such men, who, if one may use the expression, pawn themselves off to the world. They use their talents, accumulate money, carry on worldly affairs, calculate shrewdly, etc., are perhaps mentioned in history, but themselves they are not. Spiritually understood, they have no self. No self for whose sake they could venture everything. No self before God, however selfish they may be for all that. So we have covered those who do not wish to be oneself, but what about those who wish to be a self? These people are in the highest form of despair. They wish to be their true self and no longer wish to be a mass man. They no longer look outside of themselves for a cure to their despair. They look inward towards their true selves, the self that is ever present before God, the self that they truly are. And this is where something interesting occurs. When someone truly looks into the deepest recesses of themselves, they begin to notice something. They realize that their true self is actually quite imperfect. They shine a light on their soul and see all the flaws, shortcomings, failures, and the like, and they realize that this self that they truly are could never stand before a perfect God. This realization drives them into the deepest form of despair. Wanting to be oneself, but knowing that this self is not good enough to stand before God. They acknowledge their soul is eternal, and they will forever exist, and they wish to spend their eternal life with God in heaven, but they cannot because of their sin. This is the true sickness unto death. Knowing they will live forever, and yet wanting to die, because they will not spend it with God, the creator of their soul and the source of life. Now you may think, oh how depressing to be in such despair and agony over the infinite existence of the soul, and oh how impossible salvation is for man. Knowing you will eternally exist and without God the source of all things good and righteous and true. But Kierkegaard actually thinks this is the best place anyone can be. This is exactly where Kierkegaard wants you to be. He wants you to look into your soul and face your demons. Kierkegaard's goal throughout the book is to get you to realize that yourself, with all of its imperfections, will stand before God and to realize the impossibility of anyone to be saved. He does a similar thing throughout either or when he destroys all the pillars we put our faith in before presenting God as the solution. He wants you to understand how sinful you are before God where all your deeds and thoughts will be magnified and exposed. Because sin is magnified infinitely because it is before God. It can be compared to accidental manslaughter versus premeditated murder of a child. They may end with the same result, but one will result in a harsher punishment because of who the sin is against. Sin is always against God and therefore incurs the harshest of all punishments. 
Kierkegaard says this so that you realize that your salvation is impossible. There is nothing any man can do to obtain salvation on their own. And once he gets you to this point, the point of acknowledging the impossible and driving you into maximal despair, to the place where you would stand in the crowd and say, who then can be saved? Jesus will reply, with man, this is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Did you catch that? Jesus himself says that salvation is impossible with man, but God can do the impossible. Once we realize the deep despair that we are in and acknowledge the impossible, we are forced to rely on the only one who can do the impossible. Kierkegaard famously puts it like this, The decisive thing is that for God, all things are possible. This is eternally true and true, therefore, every instance. This is commonly enough recognized in a way, and in a way it is commonly affirmed. But the decisive affirmation comes only when a man is brought to the utmost extremity, so that humanly speaking, no possibility exists. Then the question is whether he will believe that for God all things are possible. That is to say, whether he will believe. But this is completely the formula for losing one's mind or understanding. To have faith is precisely to lose one's mind in order to win God. Suppose a man is brought to his limit where no human possibility of salvation exists. Will he choose to believe that for God all things are possible? We are all, in a sense, at our limit by means of despair. This is when we must choose to either believe that God can save us from our despair or not. We cling to this possibility of salvation by faith. Just as it was said of Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So too must we believe that God can do the impossible and cling to this promise that he will save us. Can we take this leap of faith into the absurd, into what may seem impossible and illogical? Now you may say, how does faith save anyone? Faith in what? Well, it's faith that God can save us from our despair, from our sin. God can save us through love, because God is love. He had no choice but to sacrifice everything for the sake of love, and there is no greater despair than rejecting this love. Again, Kierkegaard puts it like this, Because of love, God became man. He showed us what being a human truly should be. As man, he took the form of a lowly servant and was humble in order to show that it is not by human acclaim or status that we get closer to God, but by humbling ourselves and becoming a lowly servant that God will lift us up. As the Bible says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore before the Lord and he will lift you up. You see, all despair and sin stems from one place rejecting God's love, rejecting his salvation. Heaven is God's glory, where truth reigns, love overflows, and righteousness streams out. Hell is separation from all things good, that is, God. I once heard it said, all that are in hell, choose it. What I think is meant by this is that people choose to reject God. They do not want to submit to him and let him lift them up. They would rather live by their own strength and do what they want rather than what God wants. They are separating themselves from God every day by their deeds. They do not wish to be attached to God and therefore God gives them exactly what they want. They didn't want God while they were alive, so God also gives them what they want when they are dead. This is the second death, to be eternally separated from God, the source of life. So to you, Kierkegaard asks, what will you choose? Will you be indifferent towards Jesus' sacrifice? Will you reject it? Or will you take the leap of faith and choose to believe that God can do the impossible, that he could save even the most wretched of all sinners? I hope you enjoyed this video. I spent a lot of time on it and I hope you liked it. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. Do you think Kierkegaard is right? Is God the only solution to despair? I would also recommend reading Fear and Trembling or checking out my video that I did on it if you want more information about this. Thanks for watching.